Today, I get to talk to my friend, Jeremy Horn. Jeremy is head of analytics at a media advertising agency, which utilizes machine learning in order to help clients extract value from their customer databases. I originally had the pleasure of meeting Jeremy last year at a conference we were both presenting at. Jeremy gave a fantastic presentation on machine learning to a packed room. You actually had to stand in the back if you wanted to see him speak. So today's talk, we are going to go over machine learning, some of the myths of machine learning, and how organizations as well as data professionals can get started. So I hope you really enjoy this talk with my friend, Jeremy Horn. If you're new to this channel and you're keen to learn the latest tips, tricks, and tools for working more effectively with data, please hit the subscribe button for weekly videos. So, Jeremy, good to Hello. speak. Hey. It's fant fantastic to talk. And as, as you said, I was pretty surprised when that talk was quite packed at the R conference. I thought, there's lots of other people talking. Why is everyone here to see me? It kind of puts yeah. the pressure back onto it. Um, and there are even some people in there that have seen it before. And I said, oh, I'm sure you've seen this before. I said, like, yeah, yeah, but I've got to come back. So I must be doing something right. Fair enough. So, um, yeah, could you tell us a little bit more about the, some of the work that you do uh, down at MCNC Media and some of the work that you do for clients? Sure. So MCNC Media, just as a little bit of background, we're an independent media agency. We're based in the UK, but we are expanding internationally and dealing with clients that do their business in more than one market. Um, so I've been there for about 18 months now. I head up the analytics offering that we have. So being a media agency, traditional analytics would be marketing analytics. So that will be things like econometric modeling, attribution, scenario planning, trying to tell people how effective their spend is. But since I've been there, we've had a little bit of a shift. We're still focusing on marketing analytics, but we're moving more towards customer analytics as well. And the two of them kind of work hand in hand. The better you understand your customers, the better it is that you can market them as well. And when we say customer analytics, that'll be things like very simple database analytics. So who are your customers? What age are they? Where do they live? How much do they spend, et cetera? To things like profiling them. So we, we use Experian. We're an Experian reseller using the Mosaic database where we can profile up to 25% of a customer data set. And what that gives us is rich behavioral information. So it's not just where do they live, but what types of household do they live in? How many children have they got? What types of media do they consume? And we can overlay that with tools like TGI to give us a little bit more information on their attitudes and on their behaviors. And then as soon as we've got this really detailed picture, that's where machine learning comes in. So machine learning is brilliant at pattern recognition. And there's no bigger pattern than in a customer database. So as soon as you've got all that rich behavioral and attitudinal information, you can overlay a machine learning model to answer questions like, who's going to purchase this month? Who can I send some kind of mailing or messaging to without offering them a discount because they're still going to purchase? Who's going to respond to my direct mail campaign? Who's going to donate to my next charity mailer? Mailer. So it's really interesting that you can ask these you know, quite specific and quite pointed questions of your customers once you've got that rich data that everybody now has. Right, right. Now, that's interesting, actually. And when you say everybody now has, um, so one of the things that uh, I think we were talking about another time was uh, some of the myths about uh, machine learning and um, a lot of the questions about whether organizations actually have enough data uh, to be able to get started. So... Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. And I think that machine learning now, a lot of people are using it, but there's also still this, or, or a cohort of people that are a little bit scared and think, I don't have enough data, or I've got very, very disorganized data. And a lot of the databases I've worked with over the past year, they come in all different shapes and sizes. So some people will have data in very, very old databases with six different data sources that you've got to merge together and you've got your transactions in one place and you've got your customer data in another place and then you've got all your personal attributes somewhere else and it becomes quite difficult. So really the key thing, first of all, is to make sure that you're having one central source of the truth. Push everything into one database, into one data source. But don't worry too much about things like gaps in the data because that's where people get a little bit scared that they've got a lot of missing information. Now, I'm not saying if you have 80% of your database blank, machine learning is going to be brilliant, but 
but it's yep. good at handling some gaps because it works on patterns. So if you're missing a variable for some people, it will just ignore that variable and use the other information to detect the patterns. So I think gappy data is one of the, one of the biggest drawbacks for people, but I would say don't be afraid of it. Make sure that you get your data into a, some kind of consistent or consolidated view, and then you can start looking at the richness and the benefit in it. I think the other thing, aside from gappy data, is people worry that I haven't got enough history within my data set. Everything's very different. In some, in some cases, you don't need a lot of history. And if I look back at when I first started doing machine learning in 2005, um, I was working with share trading data. Now with that, if you go back a year, things change so much. You probably only need about three or four weeks worth of information to be able to detect how patterns move and how patterns change. In customer data, it depends on the brand, it depends on the, the product that you're offering. So how quick is that sale? If it's something people buy every two minutes, then you probably don't need a lot of history. If it's mm. things like charity data where people might donate as often, you might need one to two plus years worth of history. But the key thing is experiment. Try and build a model, try and keep it simple and see what you can get out of it. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting, actually, because I, I think uh, in terms of the amount of data, I, I think with some of these techniques, effectively, it's looking for patterns, right? So, yeah. you know, um, how long, how much data do you need to form a pattern? Well, if you are working with tick data or minute data or something like that, then potentially you don't need to go back very far, right? Um, of course, you've got things like if you were to incorporate things like maybe seasonality or something like that, then maybe having a few years of data is kind of useful, but maybe you don't necessarily need that data, right? So. Um, so is yeah, it absolutely. And I think we work with lots and lots of different clients. So if I take our clients that are in the travel industry, for example, there is seasonality there because people book holidays or they'll, they'll book excursions at a certain time of year, right? We all book our mm -hmm. holidays in January because we're all quite miserable after Christmas. There's a massive spike in the way that people book. Um, and they counteract that with advertising. They'll advertise a lot more at that time of year. If I look at a health and fitness client, they're very similar. In January, everyone's going back to the gym. So let's plug a load of advertising. That's where we get most people through the door. Whereas something like a charity donation, there can be spikes around Christmas because people will donate around that time of year. But the rest of it is very, very different. And so you've really got to think about the product and the brand that you're offering. Seasonality, sometimes it's good to build up that picture. In other brands, you just need to experiment. Try six months worth of history, try a year. You might even be able to try even less than that. But just try and see what the results look like. But just don't be scared of trying it. Mm -hmm. Nice. So typically, at what stage do companies actually come and approach you to say, hey, look, um, we think we could maybe do something with our customer database. Um, what, do you think, uh, what do you think you can do? I think that really the first approach, before we get into a machine learning conversation, it's really about understanding the database. Mm -hmm. So... We have two sets of clients. We have our clients that we work with on the media side, but we're also almost a consultancy in terms of data and analytics. So we'll set ourselves up to work with clients that aren't having their media bought through the agency, but need that data and analytics support. And so there's two ways of entry. Most people, when they're coming in on the data and analytics side, it's, I've got some customer data. So they tend to be startups or SMEs, people that have got data, not necessarily the right capabilities, or the right data teams in-house and say, look, I've got some data, I've collected it over a few years, but I don't know very much about it. What can you tell me about my data? What else can I add to it? And this is where the profiling bit comes in. So it's often a case of understanding the data and then saying, you know what you need to do next? You've got to work out how these people tick and how to contact them in the best way. That's where machine learning can come in. So there's almost that bit that you've got to do beforehand to really get under the skin of the data. And the reason that's so important is because with machine learning, it's about asking the question in the right way. Mm. So if you want to say asking the question in the right way, saying how much is customer X going to spend is a really difficult question to ask because it's a continuous variable. I, I as customer X could spend anything from nothing to infinity over the next month. Whereas if you say, is this person going to purchase? It's a yes or no answer. You're keeping it a lot simpler for the machine. And it's a lot easier to detect the patterns over two variables than it is over a continuum. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. 
So what would you say are some of the kind of key types of questions that um, you think customers should actually be focusing on? I, really, I think the key types of questions, so again, it depends what you're doing as a business, but if you're, if you're a business that's sending out tons and tons of direct mail, um, the key questions you want to be asking are, who should I be sending it to? Right? Direct mail is really expensive. Mm. Uh, it costs a heck of a lot to send it to you know, even a few thousand people, and your response rates are very, very low. You know, typically, if you're getting one or two percent response, you're probably doing quite well. So it's thinking about, okay, can I stream that a little bit? Can I use a model to tell me, based on the way that people have responded in the past, who's going to respond to the next mail out I send? Mm. And for a direct mail business, that can save you millions because if you think about the number, if you mail 100,000 people, if you can cut that down to 20% of them, and you're doing that three or four times a year, it can save you tons and tons of money. If you're not a direct mail business and you're more about, I've got a product and I'm pushing it through a store, I'm pushing it through an online portal, the key thing is who do I target in terms of advertising? So who is going to purchase my product next month? Or more crucially, what you're seeing a lot of brands do now is discounting. So you get, everybody's been there before, you're sitting in front of your email account, you get something through that says 50% off purchase now. And actually you're going to purchase it anyway, but that 50% off makes you do it quicker. And so it's understanding who is going to purchase without me needing to discount them because I'm just ruining my profit margin. Mm. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I analyzed the database about a year ago and um, we did some RFE modeling. So RFE, recency, frequency, value, for those that aren't very familiar with it. And it's classifying your customers based on three attributes. So the R, recency, is when did they last make a purchase? Be anything from a day ago to years and years ago. The F bit, which is frequency, is how many times in the past have they purchased with me? And then the V, which sits in the middle of that, is the value. So how much have they spent? How many customers are there in there? And what was really interesting was we saw all the people that had purchased tons and tons of times. They purchased 15 or more products. and Their last purchase was two or three days ago. Their average purchase price of the same product was about 30 or 40% lower because the company kept plugging them with discounts all the time and they kept coming back. So actually the value was in your less frequent, less recent purchasers who purchased sort of semi-frequently, but would always do it at full price. So companies should be really, really careful. Don't be too quick to discount. Use a model to understand who needs that discount to keep them in your purchase cycle and who doesn't need it because they're gonna purchase anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, actually. That's, uh, that's some really interesting analysis. And um, what would you say as well, because uh, one of the things, that, another thing that we're talking about is that uh, people get quite concerned about machine learning being something quite complex, a bit of a, a, bit of a black box and everything. And um, what would you say to some of those people who are maybe a little bit more concerned about... Um, getting into things machine uh, like machine learning and it being something maybe too complicated to get into. Um, so I think the first thing to address in terms of concern um, is just the GDPR case because everyone talks about GDPR. Right. Um, yeah. So just before we go into some of the maths and the, the other, other reasons people might be a little bit more concerned about it from a GDPR perspective, remember that all of these customers that you're using on your database and that you're analyzing, they've opted in. Machine learning, you're not putting the data anywhere else. You're not compromising any of that. So don't be scared of GDPR as a star. In terms of the black box and the maths and everything else that people talk about, yes, there is an element to which you need to understand that. And you need to understand exactly how the mathematics behind it it works because you need to be able to frame the question in the right way. And there's parameters that go into this model. And I won't sit here and talk about all of the parameters, but if you Google Vapnik, who is the legend in terms of machine learning, I'm sure you can find lots and lots of very simple bedtime reading that will probably put you insomniacs to sleep. Uh, But the the point is, yes, you need to understand it a little bit. And that's where we can come in as consultants because we understand the maths that's behind that so can frame the models and help you ask the right questions. But in reality, the outputs are very simple. If you're looking at who's going to purchase yes or no, your output will be this person will purchase and this person won't. It will go a step further than that and give you a probability. So this person is 80% likely to purchase and this person is 
80% likely not to purchase, but that's as complex as it really gets. The outputs are simple and digestible. Uh, and obviously our job is to make sure those outputs are simple and dig digestible for people. Mm. But really don't be afraid of, I'm not going to be able to understand it. It's too complicated for me because we can help you build models. We can help you understand the output. And actually, it's no more complicated than probably any of the segmentation models that you've got in-house anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... In, in some sense, it's basically a function, right? You, yeah. you put something in and a lot of the work done is, is banging stuff into the shape to get it into the model and stuff, right? So yeah. a lot of feature engineering work, those kind of things. But uh, again, I mean, because uh, it depends who you are, right? I mean, if you're a customer, I guess yeah. you don't necessarily need to uh, be so concerned about that. Um, but uh, I guess just understanding things like uh, these, these models are probabilistic. And so, you know... Um, when you get a result that doesn't mean that that's absolutely going to be true or absolutely going to be false is uh yeah i mean you're going to have um false positives and false negatives and all those kind of things as, and stuff as well right so yeah yeah and you've got there's always that false positive and false negative trade-off so between the two of them in, in most cases a false positive is kind of okay so if it says this person's going to purchase you waste a bit of time trying to go after them and they don't that's mm. not normally a big deal for people it's the false negative that can be a problem. So saying this person's not going to do anything and, and they end up being somebody that can actually be really, really valuable to your brand and you don't go after them, that's where you can miss out on things like revenue. So it's, mm -hmm. it's an interesting trade-off between false positives and false negatives. I think the other thing to look at in terms of, as you say, it's probabilistic. It's not, this is definitely right, this is definitely wrong. But from what I've seen at higher levels of probability, the model is more accurate. So if you've got that nervousness about it, then rather than saying, okay, right, let's just have a yes or no, 50%, 50% either way. If we set our threshold at 70%, then it just gives us more confidence the model is going to work. So I tend to see at higher levels of probability, you get higher levels of accuracy. And it all goes back as, as we said, it's a simple technique. All it's doing is looking at patterns within the data, but it's patterns that are really difficult to spot with the human eye. So if you think about databases now, you know, they're millions of records long, and within each person, you've probably got about hundreds and hundreds of attributes. So as a naked eye, if you print that out and stick it on the wall in front of you, you can't see it. But a machine mapping these into a feature space in a higher dimension, that can find the patterns, that can tell you what to do. And that can really help you focus where you're going. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. There's a few interesting things uh, there, actually. So uh, one of the things that you're talking about is uh, basically the, um, the trade-off, right, between um, mm. uh, accuracy. And um, I, I think sometimes, you know, for instance, like in a lot of these Kaggle competitions and everything, there's, uh, there's this big push for maybe accuracy and, and different things like that. I think now it's better because it's uh, going towards things like AUC and those kind of things. But I think the important thing to realize is that, you know, there is this trade-off. And what does that trade-off mean to you or to your customer, right? It, it depends. You kind of have to put some uh, pricing against it or some costs against it to go, okay, well, what is the cost of uh, the uh, the false positives versus the cost of the um, the false positives or what did I say false positives versus uh, <laughs> false negatives right so <laughs> yeah yeah so, uh, yeah and I think with every project that we do we at the start we'll set out and think about okay what is the benefit so what's the benefit of mm. doing this so if I can identify. 1,000 customers that are going to do something with my brand, what does that mean to me financially? And then we can look at the, the reverse or the converse of that as well. So everything will be about laying out the benefits because I'm not the kind of person that wants to come in and just sell a project to you because it's going to make me some money. I'm all about long-term client relationships. So it's about going in, assessing the database, assessing the benefit, working out what the right thing to do is, and if the right thing to do is let's get the database in order and, and work on a machine learning model in six months to a year's time, then that's fine. But if the right thing to do is machine learning can make you a lot of money now, this is what it can make you. This is the drawback of it because there will be some false negative within that that you're going to miss out on. And then just balance that out for the client. 
And it's all about showing the amount of money you can make. And in fact, we had a really good moment. This is going back over a year ago now, um, working with the travel company. And we went in to talk to them about our machine learning models. And we said, look, you've got a massive patch of your database. They're not doing anything, not transacting, haven't done anything for years. You've built a machine learning model. And my estimate is that you're missing out on about £5 million worth of revenue. And the marketing director fell out of his chair. It's just like, oh my effing God, why are we not doing this already? Like, why have we waited so long? And so that's the message that I really want to give out here is don't wait around. If you've got this dormant database of customers that aren't doing anything, there's so much potential and so much value in there. Make sure you get into the skin of that database, analyze it, find the customers that can actually do something for you and target them. Because as soon as you get them back into the cycle, it's not about making five million pounds once. Mm. They're back in the cycle. You can make that again and again and again if you turn them into a high value or a regular transactor. Mm, no, that's that's interesting, actually. I think uh, you were mentioning that in the, some of your talk and stuff as well, weren't yeah. you? So about how a lot of people focus on this big section of the customers who spend the most and who yeah. you know buy the most and everything, but really. Uh, you should be like looking at these people who aren't necessarily buying as much and if you want to get back on board. So that's a, that's a really interesting thing to focus on actually. And then um, I guess uh, using some techniques to uh, kind of pull out that information to be able to uh, get more insight and more, focus more on those uh, people as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And everybody does it. We all focus on the customers that are purchasing all the time um, that have been with us for years and years and years. But actually, in a way, those customers, 90% of the time, they look after themselves. Mm. So they're purchasing regularly. They understand the brand. Yes, there needs to be that sense of they feel valued as a customer, but you don't need to touch in as often. Whereas the people that haven't done anything for years and years and years, there could be some value in there. And just showing them a little bit of love even for a short space of time to bring them back into the journey, to get them excited about your product and your brand again, it can be worth tons. It can be worth millions of pounds. And so really make sure you're spending some time focusing on that and not just keeping people happy that are already really, really happy anyway. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Because uh, I mean, it's worth noting. I mean, these are not like cold, like these are not like completely new leads yeah. or anything either. They're already customers, but just customers who haven't necessarily engaged for a while. So, you know, like the, I think the most expensive part of any business is, is basically acquiring those new customers in, in the first place. So I, I think, like you said, showing them some love and yeah. getting back onto the, uh, I guess, fan base or whatever, if you will, um, yeah. can be a hugely valuable thing to do. Yeah, and that's the key thing. They're not cold customers. Doing machine learning on a cold data set is really hard because it's cold. You don't have the understanding. You don't have a pattern to really look at because there is no pattern. With these customers, you've got so much information on them. If they've been on your database for five years, not doing very much, you've got that information there. You tend to know a little bit about them, who they are. You can profile them and add more information. And on the profiling side of things, it's doing things like mosaic profiling or Experian profiling, appending the data back to your data set so that you can say this person is in mosaic group A01 or B, whatever. Um, that can actually help you with the model. So if you put in postcodes, a postcode is just literally a random string of letters and numbers. You might as well put a random number generator in as a column. If you put in an Experian mapping, it tells you more about the richness. And that from, from uh, past experience you probably improve a model prediction by about 30 percent so the quality of the model wow. goes up because you're feeding it something that tells you about behavior not just a random postcode it literally is random mm. so uh, could you talk a little bit more about that actually so experian is like um a third-party service that uh, a data provider that uh, provides um additional information about uh uh, people based on postcodes or something like that? or uh... Yeah, so Experian. I mean, probably everyone's heard or thinks of Experian as them lot that I look at my credit report on, yeah. um, which is true. I mean, Experian and there is a credit agency, and we all know exactly what our credit score is through Experian. But we partner with them from well on a couple of things, but mainly from our side, it's that mosaic and that profiling side. So it's taking a customer database, we can profile up to 25% of it in-house, 
without incurring a licensing fee for Experian. And that profile returns, it's almost just a really easy to understand spreadsheet that tells you where your customers are in their Mosaic database. So Mosaic splits the UK into 15 different types of people, but within each of those types, you've got more, so 15 groups, and then within each of those groups, you've got more detailed types. So you've got up to 60 something types of people. And so it will tell you roughly what type of customer you have. So you might end up saying that my customers are in mosaic groups A and N, which means they're aged X, so they're aged between, and again, I'm making this up because I don't know A and N off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah, yeah. They're aged between 30 and 40, they earn 60 grand a year, they live in a semi-detached house with their two kids, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you that information. And then when you overlay it with other media tools such as TGI, it can tell you a bit more about how they believe and how they think. So are they ethically minded? Do they go into shops and look at the backs of products to make sure that they haven't been tested on animals? Um, what do they think about Brexit? That's always the key one at the moment. Everyone's talking yeah. about Brexit. What's their attitude towards that? Are they kind of EU focused? They Britain, fo- et cetera, et cetera. Mm, interesting, interesting. So this is, this is what you were talking about before, how you don't necessarily need that much information on customers to start with because you can really augment it with some of these uh, other, other services. And um, what would you say, what was the kind of minimum information that you need uh, existing in your customer databases to be able to augment it with this other, these external data sources? Um, so from an experience perspective, it's, it's profiled on a postcode basis. You can use email, email addresses, mobile numbers, a little bit dodgy with GDPR, of course, but postcode mm-hmm. is the best way to go. And they tend to be able to match around 90% of postcodes back to your database. Um, you'd want a minimum of about 2,000 matchback records to get a statistically significant sample within each of the different types. So you probably go in with about two and a half thousand ish records to be able to bring a a, a decent enough sample size back. So we're not talking masses of data here. Yes, that two and a half thousand has got to be 25% of your database. So 10,000 records, 10,000 people, but you can do it as an SME. You can do it almost as if not a startup, but when you've been in business for a couple of years, um, there are ways of profiling your entire database. It does cost a little bit more money. But you don't need reams of data to be able to get really good and targeted actionable insight. And that's the key thing is making sure you can take insight, action it and make yourselves more money. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting, uh, interesting stuff. <laughs> and uh, what would you say for, um, so moving on from the kind of business and customer yeah. side of things, what would you say for aspiring data analysts or data scientists um, what kind of um, what kind of things do you think are important to learn? Yeah, I think things are changing now. And if I look at you know, when I first got into it, and when I first became an analyst in two thousand and five, um, I literally worked in spreadsheets, and mm. I probably did for a few years. Um, and I started working for a company in the city, and I think on my first or second day, uh, the owner of the company just he, he threw down some papers on my desk and said something called R, learn it. And that was the brief. So yeah. I did a little bit of research. Um, I went onto the R website and printed off a manual of how, how to learn R in nine easy steps or whatever. Very, very gray, very black and white. You know, not, not the most exciting read that you've ever seen. Yeah. And I tried to teach myself. Um, you've got to remember this was back in 2005. Went on yeah. to a few help forums. Um, back then, R help forums were incredibly dormant and incredibly rude. Yeah. We were going in 2005, and nowadays when people think, oh, yeah, someone's had that problem before, let me Google it. No one had had that problem before because no one was coding in R. Yeah. Apart from the two or three people that manned these forums where you'd put a question on, and about two months later, you'd get a response pretty much saying, you idiot, you don't know how to do that already. It's easy to do it <laughs> like this. Um, so it was really, really hard then. But looking at it now, you know, I'd, I'd love to be somebody that was learning something like R right now because mm. there's so much information available out there and there's so much free information as well. So mm. not just with the R project and with Stack Overflow, things like London R or local R user groups are brilliant because you can go along, you can meet fellow R users, you can talk to people and all of a sudden it gives you the spark of, well, I could go and do that as well. 
or you can see a talk and that's where I get a lot of my inspiration from looking at what other people are doing thinking why aren't we doing that it's not that hard and going back and doing a little bit of research on my own working out how to do it looking in forums so things like data science central that's a brilliant forum as well there's a lot of inspiring content on there it's just sitting down and reading sitting down and learning um, I do a lot of work within R, so I, as I say I learned it in 2005 Yep. didn't really look at it much for about the next five years and then in 2010 when it was a bit friendlier there was a lot more content out there it was a really good time to step up and start becoming a lot more involved yeah. um, and as I always say to people coding is the future and everyone thinks I'm really mad but I am teaching my two-year-old son how to code nice. and how to code within R and I was working from home last week and he walked into the room and uh, I really wish I had this on video because no one's ever going to believe me. He walked, into, <laughs> he walked up to my laptop. I had our studio open. I was doing, I can't even remember what I was doing. I was writing a script to bring in some XML data or something like that. And he pointed at the R studio screen. No word of a lie. He pointed at it and he said, Dplyr. <laughs> wow. So <That's> <laughs> it is the future. Very, very nice. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, a lot of people don't realize that coding, I mean, even coding, uh, there's, it can seem like something quite mystical in a way, but it's really gotten a lot easier. And it's one of those things where there's this kind of massive scale, right? It can be like really pretty easy and it can also be, uh, it can get quite sophisticated, right? So, um, and, and I think there's obviously a lot of very clever users um, and sometimes that can maybe put off beginners from getting started. But, you know, a lot of times, I mean, back ages ago, if you need to write, if you need to sort some data, you needed to write a sort function, right? And now you just call up the function arrange or something like that. Um, and it does it, and it does it all for you. And so, you know, these days, I think coding is very, um, I think it is like a lot more intuitive. It's, it's almost like writing, uh, you know, a set of uh, process notes effectively, except more formal than that, right? Because it actually, then a computer does the work for you instead of like a person doing the work for you. And the co computers are basically kind of infinitely scalable, right? So um, I think it makes a, a lot of sense to do that. Right? You've hit the nail on the head there as well, because you're, you're completely right. It is a process. It is doing the work that a human can do. And nowadays, it's all about repeatable analysis. Hmm. If you've done something once, you're probably going to be repeating that again at some point. Or if you're doing a report for your client once a week, or even once, sometimes people do things once a day. A client hmm. wants a daily report on something. If you're spending two hours pulling data into a spreadsheet, putting a few functions in, sorting it, pivot tables, VLOOKUPs, whatever other Excel buzzword you can get in there, if hmm. you spend two hours doing that, why not write yourself a script? It mm. might take you three or four hours to write the script. It might take you a little bit longer, but that is a one-off cost. After that, you'll get your two-hour job done in 10 minutes every day. So mm. you're saving a heck of a lot of time, but you're able to then kind of redeploy that time to look at more interesting things. That's where you can get your machine learning in. That's where you can get your, okay, now I've done the report, which is you know, almost like the, the hygiene bit of it. Let's just tell people what's going on. Now we can actually make a difference. We can produce something really actionable. And so repeatable analysis is really important now. Having a, a set of code that runs through a process is much better than doing it yourself. It's quicker, but it also reduces that error, right? We're all humans. We can all mm. copy the wrong bit of a spreadsheet into the wrong other bit of a spreadsheet. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, all of the numbers that come out the back of that are completely wrong. A process yeah. is to do that. It doesn't forget to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that's one of the things that's so important about code, actually. Uh, well, one of the real benefits of it is that, yeah, I mean, everything is completely repeatable. Um, it's, it is kind of like documentation in itself, right? Um, you can, uh, you know, get it, use things like version control, right, which are uh, also kind of really important and and there's all these all these benefits. Um, you can copy stuff right from like Stack Overflow or from Google and, and different things like that. And uh, there's so much stuff that you can leverage, right? I mean, ours got over ten thousand libraries, right? And um, like you said, once you get the base kind of stuff done, then then that's when the real fun stuff happens, right? That's when the really exciting stuff happens. And you can start to stack on things like machine learning or graph network analysis or different types of visualizations and all that sort of thing, right? So, 
Yeah, it's, it's brilliant because you can get everything in order and then you can put on all of your additional analysis over the top of that. And as you say, there's so much content out there now. There was only a handful of libraries when I started looking at this in 2005. In fact, at the time, the company I was working for, they'd written their own machine learning algorithm. And one of the first things they asked was, can you test it against the functionality in R? Because R's free, right? If I'm a client, I'm going to go for the free thing over the, over the thing that's going to cost me lots and lots of money. Mm. And I tested it and said, no, you're fine. There's one machine learning algorithm in R, and it's a load of rubbish. Uh, and back, back then, it couldn't compete. Mm. In 2012 or whatever it was, and they said, have a look at what's going on in R now. And I sort of did a report and found reams of machine learning algorithms, tested a few of them, said, you know what? R's a lot better than you're doing now. Mm. Um, and then it became about the expertise. Well, we understand machine learning, so we can consult in the fact that we can understand the maths behind it and help people ask the right questions. There's no point developing a product when free things are coming out all the time. And there's yeah. loads of great machine learning packages out there in R at the moment. It's also improved a lot. You mentioned visualization. Visually in 2005, R was horrific, right? We had those base R graphics, which looked terribly pixelated and stick them in front of a client and I think your two-year-old kid drew it. But <laughs> nowadays with things like ggplot2 and with Shiny, um, and Plotly, you, you can actually make your, your graphics look really, really professional. Um, and you've got GG themes as well, which can put something over your GG plot and make it look like is that something that you'd see on the BBC or on in a newspaper somewhere. Yeah, I mean, in fact, um, I saw an article recently that the uh, the BBC actually has their own uh, GG plot. A library for doing some of the visualizations, which is kind of cool. So, uh, yeah. did some of that in R, which is uh, which is pretty neat. Yeah, and, that made, it made me happier when I saw that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's very cool. And um, yeah, these days, I mean, you know, people are paying for products like Tableau and Power BI and all these kinds of things, and you know, you can generate a lot of that for free, basically in R. Um, and what's more, uh, you know, like some of these things, like. Power BI is kind of neat, right? Because I, I think you guys use that uh, a little bit as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because I mean, if just for yourself, you can get started and it's nice because, you know, there's, uh, there's kind of pretty much no learning curve to get into something like Power BI. Um, but there is a certain cost once you start to distribute it, right? Whereas, you know, you produce something in R and it's like in all these open formats, right? And um, you can share all your work in all its kind of glory with all the visualizations, interactivities and everything, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, there's a place for the, the Power BI's and the Tableau's of this world. And if you're somebody that wants really polished, neat visualizations, that's probably going to give you something a lot more than even a Shiny app could do in R. And we do use Power BI. I mean, we, we've used Tableau in the past. We do use Power BI now. It's really great because you can integrate your R scripts into Power BI as well. Mm -hmm. So it's about things working together. Yeah. Don't use anything in a silo. You know, even mm -hmm. dare I mention in an R talk, dare I mention the word Python. but <laughs> R and it's not it's not about r or python there's a place for both and actually no, getting them to work together so mm. never think r or python think r and python mm. if i've got a python script and if that's going to be more efficient like i don't code in python but if somebody gives me a python script that's useful mm. i can use the two together yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you've got great packages like Reticulate and everything, which allow yeah. you to kind of merge the two. And, you know, I think uh, like if you look at the um, Amazon kind of philosophy and everything, they basically do stuff via APIs because, you know, there's so much talent and people with different skills working in all of these different programming languages. And to be frank, like different programming languages are just stronger for different kinds of things, right? So Python's got a lot of history and a lot of other things other than data analytics, which, you know, like ours kind of always been for. But, you know, and you've got a lot of the machine learning libraries and everything, which are basically being developed by the tech companies in, in Python, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it is, there is definitely value of having both. Um, now, one of the things that I uh, uh, want to kind of explain to people as well is how much of each do you necessarily need to learn? Because you mentioned yourself, I mean, you're an R programmer, but you could take, you can still, because you know how to code, you can read Python code and kind of pull it in when you need to, right? So you can focus on one, um, but then still be able to use kind of others, right? 
Yeah, and I think you know, I I, I code in R. I, I'm never I'm never going to go out there and be able to code in Python. If I need to call upon it, I will, and I'll probably get somebody else to write the code for me. Mm. But understanding one of them and understanding it fairly well, you don't need to understand everything. As you said, there's over ten thousand libraries out there. Don't go and sit there and try and learn all ten thousand of them. Yeah, learn the basics. So just if you've never used R before. Open up an R Studio console. Open up R Studio. Don't use the base console, which I haven't used for years and years and years. But just teach yourself how to do a few simple things. And there's loads of tutorials out there online. Go through a few of them, learn the basics, and then start thinking about what do I need from it? Am I somebody that needs to visualize reams of data? Do I need to automate a report? Do I really need to get to grips and get to understand the data and use a big machine learning model? Think about what you need to do and focus on the area that's going to give you the quickest win first mm. because you'll pick things up along the way. You'll learn something you didn't expect to know. You'll be building a regression model in R and all of a sudden you'll learn about a really simple and neat way of, I don't know, shaping your data. So you, you'll have to use reshape two or something like that to be able to you know, mold your data frames into a way that you want to work more effectively. So you'll learn things along the way. Look at your main problem first, focus on solving it, and then see what you pick up as you go along the journey. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, like a, a key starting point for a lot of people, because, you know, a lot of people are using things in Excel, right? Like a lot of businesses mm. and organizations are running Excel sheets. And maybe that's okay to a certain extent. But, you know, like as you mentioned before, uh, you know, the stuff is not repeatable, right? It's, it's kind of not automated. And, you know, really to do almost everything in Excel, <laughs> you only have to maybe learn like uh, a couple dozen commands in R and you can already do pretty, pretty much everything in Excel. Um, and then from there, you can kind of start building on top of it. And it's like you said, it's not about going out and learning everything because it's 10,000 libraries, right? Yeah. Um, and the cool thing about that is, is that, you know, anything that you want to do is probably already been done and you just need yeah. to kind of pull it in. But being able to focus in on the actual job that you need to do and go, okay, well, now that I have the basics and foundations, well, I could do this, I could do that, but focus on the job that you need to do. Yeah, yeah, and two things. If anyone out there is thinking, I don't know where to start. Number one, Stack Overflow, it's brilliant. Somebody's had the problem before. And if you're gonna learn anything in R, learn the Tidyverse. The Tidyverse is really great because it's got all of the packages you need to be able to take your data and give yourself an output in the same way that you probably do it within Excel. So it can give you things like shaping your data, giving you an, an overview report, summarizing it into a way that's really meaningful for your client. You can get a few visuals off the back of that through ggplot. So actually, that's the best place to start. Don't sit there and try and build a few matrices, which I think every... Every single R training teaches you how to do. Mm. Yes, there's a place for it, but mm. clients not interested in a five by five matrix. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely, right? You know, I think Tidyverse has massively changed the game for mm. R. You know, I think it makes yeah. it so much easier and more accessible for people. Uh, you've got all the cheat sheets from R Studio, which yeah. you can download and, and have everything right there. Um, yeah. And it kind of does all the stuff that Excel does. I mean, uh, a lot of the R training, like sometimes when people say, oh, you know, like R is kind of uh, difficult to learn or whatever it is, it's like, well, you know, maybe you're looking from a, at a stats lecture from 20 years ago or, or something mm. like that, right? Um, which is kind of the original history of R, but I mean, it's developed so much since then. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I started learning R, I didn't have the tidyverse. I had base R. I had, you know, really ugly lines of code to be able to subset and filter data sets. So now you've got the tidyverse. It, it's really easy. And actually, when you think about it, the commands are doing exactly what they say they're going to do. Yeah. You've got filter. Filter this data source by this field. You've got select. It's, it's just, it's so intuitive that it's really easy to pick up even if you don't have that mindset that can help you work through a process. Mm, no, it's very nice. All right. Anyway, it's uh, been really, really great talking to you today. And um, I should probably let you get going You're back. <laughs> so, um, but if anybody wants to reach out to you and get in touch with you, uh, how's the uh, best way to do that? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm always around on LinkedIn. That's a really good way of finding me. So my LinkedIn yep. profile, I'm sure we can share the link at the back of this video. Um, yep, yep. Very, very, very happy to be emailed. So 
my, my very unoriginal email of Cornelius, which is um, Cornelius with an H, at hotmail.com. And again, we can share that at the back of this video as well. Very happy to talk to people about these things, particularly if it's about getting started in data science or customer analytics. I don't really know where I'm going with that. Again, reach out, get in touch. Very, very happy to have these conversations to see if we can make something work for you as well. You know, it can be a no obligation. Let's come and have a chat. And then if there's a project in there, we'll scope it out, we'll cost it up. Um, but if you just want to talk generally about machine learning, by all means, get in touch. Come and find me at London R. I tend to be there most of the time. Um, or many other data science events. I'm, I'm doing the Brighter Day, Brighton data science circuit at the moment. So if it's nice. a data event in Brighton, I may well be there too. All right. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you Brilliant. so much. For this. Uh, it's been really great talking to you. And I'm sure this will be a ton of value for everybody listening to this. So thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. So if you want to get in touch with Jeremy, learn any more about R or machine learning, please check the notes in the description below. If you found this talk helpful, please leave a thumbs up. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.